you're looking to be able to keep something to the tune of $16,000 a month. I mean, that's not too shabby for a $1.5 million business where you didn't essentially put in any of your own money other than the sweat equity and maybe a little bit of money out of pocket and due diligence. It's sweet. Hey, it's Jason Rogers here. And in this video, I wanna break down for you a business that is literally on the market right now. It's a $1.5 million landscaping business that is for sale in the state of Florida. I wanna break down a real financial analysis of this business and help you try to get better at ascertaining the true value of a business and whether or not the debt would be able to service the potential acquisition of this business, right? So if you wanted to buy this business and you wanted to use a bank to help you actually make the acquisition come to life, would that debt be serviced by the profit? That's one of the many things we're gonna dive into in this video, so let's get right to it. Okay, so first things first, what we have right here is the actual listing for the business. This profitable 30-year-old landscape maintenance and installation business. As you can see here, the asking price is 1.5 million. As you can see here, the cash flow of the business is approximately 531,000. You can see the gross revenue here of just over 4.5 million. We can tell from that quick analysis right there that it's doing a little bit more than 10% profit margins. We also see down here that there are 47 employees, which helps explain why they're doing 4.5 million plus in revenue. So this is quite a labor intensive business. It shows here that the inventory is included in the asking price and the FF&E, the furniture fixtures and equipment is included in the asking price as well. It's located again in Florida in Martin County. So with that, what I want to do now is take you to the financial calculator that I made. I actually have used this financial calculator that I'm about to show you for lots of my different deals that I do personally. This is a perfect calculator for service-based businesses, and I'm going to take you over there right now so that we can dive in more deeply. So before we go into the calculator that I've actually made for this particular landscaping deal, I wanted to show you the calculator that I use for the deals that we do personally. And this is it right here. As you can see, I'm scrolling through. And what I guess I would say, the only difference between this calculator and the one we're gonna use for the deal that we're gonna be breaking down is I didn't have this information here. This, these are the financials that we enter in into this calculator that make it work perfectly. And we enter in these financials from tax returns that we receive after we get the NDA signed, right? So once you sign a non-disclosure agreement, then either the seller or the broker will send you the tax returns, and then we put those tax returns right in here, whoops, into this document, and then from there, we proceed. But now we're gonna go to the calculator I made for this deal, and we're gonna break into it a little bit more deeply. Okay, so this is the calculator we're using for this deal. And obviously, you see the main section that's lacking is this section, and that's because, of course, I haven't signed the NDA for this profitable 30-year-old landscaping business that we're talking about here, right? I don't know anything about this business that you see right now on your screen other than what's given right here. So I have to basically just use very basic inputs. And you've heard the old, you know, the old phrase, you know, what you put in is what you get out, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So the reality of the situation is everything I've done below here, which I'm about to break you through this analysis here, this is good base level analysis, but you would obviously want to improve your inputs to have greater levels of confidence that the assumptions that were made below as I'm about to go through with you actually are truly valid. But let's dive in. So first of all, I put in the asking price, I put in the gross revenue, I put in the cash flow, and here's the first kicker, right? Why did, because if you go here, you see the cash flow is reported at 531,000 and change, right? So then why am I saying the true EBITDA is only 456,000? And the answer is, is the bank requires that you pay yourself. And specifically for the SBA, the small business uh, loan program that's, that's basically a government-backed program through the United States government, they, from my conversations with SBA lenders thus far, they prefer more or less that you take a salary of around 75,000. They actually make the argument that you should take a similar salary to what you've been making before you buy the business, but more or less the standard amount is about 75K. So what I did to get the true EBITDA, because banks, banks are gonna run the cash flow analysis based on you taking a salary. I know from experience. So what I did is I just ran this true EBITDA of taking the cash flow that was reported and then I subtracted 75,000. 
How, how did I get the profit margin? Pretty darn simple. The true EBITDA divided by the gross revenue, right? So that's all this is right here. Very simple. I took the EBITDA, 456,000, divided by the gross revenue, 10.7% profit margin. We'd prefer greater profit margins. We would prefer at least 15, if not 20 or 25% profit margins. However, I'm not an expert in the landscaping business. Maybe the landscaping business is a low margin business. But if I were actually pursuing this deal, I'd want to ascertain, is this a good, medium, or bad profit margin for this sector? Here, this business, by the way, which I calculated, is only valued at 3.28 uh, times EBITDA. How did I get that? Well, that's actually really, really, really simple, right? I mean, look at my calculation right here. I just took the asking price divided by the EBITDA, right? B2 divided by B5, 3.28, very simple. Now, let's go to the debt assumptions I worked in here. And by the way, I will quickly, quickly, uh, I'm clicking on the monthly payment. Focus on this right here. Take a screenshot of that. If you want to see that right there in this upper left-hand corner is the uh, basically the formula for how to calculate monthly debt payments so that you don't have to go to an external loan calculator. I only recently learned about that. I have a great quant business partner who really helped me out with this, and uh, he helped me make this calculator a little bit speedier. But I digress. So let's dive in. So first, the first thing I did is I made the assumption that you could procure a first position SBA note at about 85% of the total purchase price. So 85% LTV. That's why you see B2, which is the asking price, which I'm assuming we're not negotiating asking price here. And I multiply that by 0.85. Why? Obviously 85% leverage. Now, what I can tell you about the SBA is you're going to usually get for an F SBA 7 note, uh, a 7A note, I believe is what they call it. It's going to be a 10-year RAM, aka 120 months. About a 7% interest rate is probably valid, though recently with what's happening with the, the coronavirus and the like, at the time of recording this, maybe interest rates are even lower, but we say 7%, right? So when we calculate that out, that's a $14,000 and change payment per month, times that by 12, 177 k The reason you see the parentheses around that, we actually have, for this calculator to work, all payments as negative numbers because they're outflows, right? That's why the parentheses is there, it's outflow. And of course, EBITDA is a positive number because it's inflow, right? So income we have as positive numbers, outflow we have as negative numbers, I digress. One of the clever structuring things that I recommend uh, you guys consider is to have the seller carry a second position note of say five to 10% of the total purchase price. That's exactly what I worked in here. I just literally took the asking price and multiplied it by 0.05, aka 5% of the total asking price, that equals $75,000. What I did here is I worked in a first two year interest only note. That's what I wrote over here in the special conditions, right? So for the first two years, it's a $75,000 note at 7%. The monthly payment for that is only $437. The yearly payment is obviously this monthly payment times 12 for 12 months, pretty self-explanatory. What this does is it allows you to have a little bit more free cash flow in those first two years when you stabilize the business. And that's something that that SBA lenders like, it's something that you're gonna want because it's all about stabilizing that business in the beginning. But of course, you're eventually gonna have to pay that off. So whereas this second position note for the first two years is an interest only note, this is the same note, but it's just matured so that in the 25th month and beyond, you're basically then gonna start paying this thing off. I underwrote it on a 60 year, uh, a 60 month amortization, AKA a five year am at a 7% rate. And I calculated this out and that's gonna be just under, uh, you know, one and a half thousand a month. You know, for the year, that's a little over 17,000. And again, as I wrote here in the special conditions, this is the same note as above, but now we're paying off principal plus interest. That's why I call this the P&I, and that's why right there you see interest only. Okay, next, I worked in, and I don't really know what the working capital commitments would be for a landscaping business, but assuming they have 40 some odd employees, I imagine you're gonna obviously wanna make sure you can cover payroll and the like. So I am working in that we're gonna be requesting here a $250,000 uh, bit of overfinance for working capital after closing. This is a reasonable request for the SBA from everything I've researched and everything I'm, I'm learning as I go forth with the SBA right now within my, within my plumbing endeavors. And I underwrote this with the exact same terms, terms as the first position note, right? So you see the first position note on a 10 year AM, AKA 120 months, 7% you know, interest rate. I did the same thing here with the working capital and you see the monthly payment, the yearly payment, pretty self-explanatory. Now, what I did, and I'm gonna go all the way down to the cost of, uh, cost of capital and then we'll work back up to the equity assumptions. But firstly, because we have a first two year interest only note followed by, uh, uh, a second position, a second, a seller second with the principal plus interest payments. We need to run financial analysis for both the first 12, uh, first two years and then after the 
the, 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 the time after the first two years, right? And I worked both an internal model and a debt model. We'll start with the debt model because right now we just went through the, the debt assumptions you see below. I also work in equity assumptions that are right here. We'll go through those in a minute, but first let's focus on the debt model uh, and I'll just show you how this was calculated. So if I click this right here, that would be B42. If I click this right here, you're gonna see what equated, what was added up. It's pretty simple. The first position SBA note, the seller second with the interest only payment at this time and the working capital. You gotta pay back your, your working capital commitments, right? So when I add those up, that equals 18,000 and change a month in a monthly debt obligation that I have, obviously multiplied by 12, 217,000. Next, projected post 24 month payout for debt, just a little bit more. And when I click this to see what is added up, obviously very similar. Uh, the first position note, you're still making payments on that obviously, but now that seller second has transitioned to a principal plus interest note and you see 1.485. And then of course you still have the working capital that you're paying off. And so that is the monthly amount after the first two years. Going down here to the bank's cash flow analysis, what I did is I worked a worst case, a base case, and a best case scenario. First of all, the projected EBITDA per month, all this as you see PMO, that stands for per month. What I did is I took our true EBITDA here, I divided it by 12, as you can see right there in that formula, and then I multiplied it by 0.8. 0.8 meaning 80%. I'm saying worst case is we're only gonna achieve 80% of the EBITDA goal that is to be expected year after year, okay? At base case, I'm just saying it's 100% of the, the true EBITDA expectation, obviously, per month. So it's this number divided by 12, pretty damned obvious. In this, I used a 1.2 multiplier, which I actually show here. Uh, it, I, I just copied and pasted it from the other one, but you see, the, uh, you, you see here how I calculated the projected EBITDA it was very simply this divided by 12 times 1.2 for the 120%, right? So this is saying at best case, we did 120% the expectation. How did I connect, uh, how did I calculate, and I'll stick down to the bank's cash flow analysis here. How did I ca calculate the projected first 24 month free cash flow? Pretty damn simple. EBITDA plus my, my projected first 24 month payout for debt. I plus them because as you see, that's a negative number. And then of course the projected first 24 month versus the projected post 24 month. Again, you see how I did the distinctions. We went through that. That's based on the seller second that I already walked you through prior. Now the, the debt service coverage ratio, DSCRs are very simple to calculate. You take your EBITDA, you divide it by your debt commitment. Banks really care about the DSCR. Our DSCR here at base case is the projected EBITDA divided by our projected first 24 month debt payout. Boom, 209%. That is a workable DSCR all day long. And remember, this is assuming you already pay yourself a salary of 75,000 a year, right? So this is a workable DSCR. And of course I work these very same exact calculations for worst case and for best case. You can see these numbers right here. They're self-explanatory. Now, let me work to the equity assumptions. Let's talk about equity. Let's talk about raising capital which I'm a big believer that you would be far better off just fundraising 10% of the capital stack in cash, giving an investor 10% of the equity in the subsidiary, right? So you have Topco and then you have all the subsidiaries under Topco as you make multiple acquisitions, give away 10% of the equity to an investor or investors plural at the subsidiary and use that capital as your down payment. That's a simple way to do it. And where the way we've structured our equity, you're seeing the yearly rates of return that we're projecting to give investors and I'll break down how we came to this, but we're at base case, you see this is base case, we're projecting that we're gonna be able to give them something to the effect of 29%. At best case, we're expecting about a 35% yearly rate of return. Now, let, let me break this down for you a little bit. First of all, when I took to the, uh, when I took to this capital stack that we worked here through the debt assumptions, what, you know, if you add this, First position seller note with the SBA, uh, excuse me, when you add the first position SBA note with the seller second, and then you subtract that from the total asking price, 1.5, and assuming that you don't use your working capital at closing, because you want to keep that as working capital, right? Maybe to split between you and your partners or to actually keep as working capital to make sure you, you keep the engine, you know, properly lubricated, right? What you need, assuming all that, is 150,000 in cash 
You, you got to find that. So that's where we go here, right? You need $150,000 in cash. Now, here's how we structure equity, and this is working great for us right now for fundraising. This is working super, super, super well. We've raised over $100,000 using exactly what I'm sharing with you right now. We've done this in the last month, so listen closely. First, we give a 15% yearly preferred rate of return on invested capital. So for $150,000, I happen to have already did the math, that turns to a yearly distribution of $22,500, a monthly distribution. You basically just take the yearly distribution, you divide it by 12, simple math. Now, what we also do is we give the investor, and this is, let's just assume for this example, one investor puts in all the money, the whole $150,000 that we're raising, and given it's a $1.5 million deal and they put in 150,000, they put in 10% of the money, great, we're gonna give you 10% of the deal. That's how we structure it. That one-to-one -one equity arbitrage works, especially when you also tack on a 15% base preferred rate of return like, like what's structured here. And then what we did is we took the worst case, best case, uh, worst case, base case, and best case uh, cash flow examples, which we calculated here, right? We calculated these cash flow examples here. And by the way, this is the internal cash flow analysis. And we give them basically, we give them 10% of what's left in, in cash flow, which by the way, this deal happens to work really well. I'm not gonna go through this at length. This is pretty simple stuff to calculate. But again, how did we calculate the first 24 month free cash flow? Very simply, we added the projected uh, payout, the, the basically the debt obligation. We added it with the EBITDA. And because this was made as a negative number, you know, the stronger number survives. And of course, that's that's positive free cash flow. That's why it's in the green. You see our internal debt service coverage ratio, and really I should call it a capital commitment coverage ratio because this is in, this is including, and you see, includes the investor 15% APR payout. Now, if I actually wanted to get the precise, true projected free cash flow that would be available after we even make the 10% dividend for the LLC stake that we're giving, what I would do is I would take these numbers and I would times it by 0.9. I would times it by 0.9. Why would I times it by 0.9? Because you just gave away a 10% equity stake in the business, so you're gonna to wanna to times it by 0.9 because you're gonna to get to keep 90% of the free cash flow, right? But in any case, look at, I mean, at, at base case, you're looking to be able to keep something to the tune of $16,000 a month. I mean, that's not too shabby for a $1.5 million business where you didn't essentially put in any of your own money other than the sweat equity and maybe a little bit of money out of pocket and due diligence. It's sweet, right? So ultimately what I did is I took these numbers here. I'm going to get I'm going to get rid of these now because it actually changes the variable a little bit. I I can't I need to be able to take 10% out of the total free cash flow. I can't give the investor 10% out of 90%. That would be a scam. Right, but anyways, at base case, how did I calculate this monthly distribution? Very simply, I go right here. This is the projected first 24 month free cash flow per month at base case, 18,000 and change, right? I take that number and I times it by 10%, 0.1, right? And we use negative numbers for payouts because it helps our calculator work. But that number equals $1,805 times it by 12 equals 21 and change. And then what we do for the total distribution, right? So you see monthly distribution, yearly distribution, total distribution is we add the yearly distribution for the 10% LLC stake at base case added with the 15% return on invested capital right here. So these are two types of dip, two types of returns, if you will. You have the preferred 15% rate of return, which I'll make bigger here so you can clearly see it. And then you have, here, I'll make it real big. Boom, you have that, right? You have this 15% and I'll make it red because it does hurt you a little bit. You have to pay that. And in this case, let's just say you achieve a base case for the first two years. You also, so you pay this and you pay this, you add those two numbers up, it equals 44,000 and change. And how do you get the ROI percentage? Very simple. You take the total distribution per year and you divide it by the $150,000 the investor paid in and that equals 29.44%. What I can tell you sincerely is when you have a unique business that you're bringing to the, to the marketplace and you're bringing to investors and you're able to offer investors, you know, 25 to 30 to even 35% rates of return, they will be interested, especially if you're in a compelling sector, you put together great marketing materials and you have a great team built around you. If you have all those things, this will work and you'll be able to easily fundraise that $150,000. And then notably, you'll be able at base case for simply making a barely 
you know, a barely million dollar plus deal, I mean, only 1.5 million, you will be able in theory, and of course you have to execute, but very much practically, you would be able to make something to the tune of $18,000 in free cash flow for your business per month on top of that base 75 salary, $75,000 a year salary that the SBA more or less requires you to take. But this is the financial calculator and this is the analysis of this deal right here that is literally on bizbuysell.com today as of the date of recording this. That's it. One last word of warning. Make sure with businesses that you're analyzing that you ask for the tax returns and be very discerning with those tax returns and make sure that the small business owner didn't cook the books and basically flub the tax returns because banks don't look at that lightly. So if you're dealing with a business owner that has cooked books, you're basically going to either need to negotiate a lower purchase price, you're gonna to need to negotiate seller, a big old seller, a first position seller finance note, or you're gonna need them to come way further on a second position seller finance note. I can talk about that more in a future video if you have questions, but now, thumbs up the video, subscribe for more content like this. Thank you so much. Share your comments below what you want me to talk about next, and I'll talk to you in the next video.